And it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. The first speaker today is Anton Zorich, a professor of Stoll Tech and the University of Paris. And he will tell about how to count square tiled surfaces. Please, Anton. Thank you, Peter. So the pleasure is mine because I'm uh, physically in the Chebyshev Laboratory in St. Petersburg, I have participants, so I have, I'm speaking to the true audience, and I'm really happy. It's much more fun than speaking to, to a screen at home. So today, yeah, uh, Dimas Wonkin in his lecture series presented their the objects, uh, well, the, the intersection numbers of psi classes wrapped into some generating functions and showed how they satisfy this generating function, satisfy some um, partial differential equations. And he treated this subject from a point of view of algebraist. So I will treat similar subject, but from a point of view of an engineer, or if you wish, experimental mathematician. So when people speak about theoretical physicists and uh, experimental physicists, physicists, nobody loves But when I say experimental mathematician, people take, me, take it as a joke. No, I'm not joking. I claim that experimental mathematics has right for existence. And for me, it's quite a respectful science, but if you, if you don't consider this as a serious science, then take me for an engineer. So, oops. I managed to block my pointer. I apologize. Yeah, I have to change that. No, but it doesn't. Yes, probably it is. So do you see my screen? Yes. Good. So, so I start where more or less where Dimas Wonkin stopped. So first I will, so my, my plan for today is the following. I will recall the definition of intersection numbers of psi classes and will show how, uh, well, several examples of their applications to industry, if you wish. So the industry would be counting problems. And the first counting problem would be counting of metric ribbon graphs. And the second problem, so the, the first problem is solved already a while ago. And the problem which I'm interested in is counting square tile surfaces. And this, so the goal of Today's talk is to count the square tile surfaces, and then in the remaining time, I will try to explain why counting of square tile surfaces is the same as counting of volumes of moduli space, of certain moduli space. But let me start from this intersection numbers of psi classes. So uh, I hope that either you attended lectures of Dimas Wankin or you have seen this object separately. So I'm considering the Deline Mumford quantification of the moduli space of smooth complex curves of genus G with M1 points. And I have uh, N holomorphic line bundles or tautological bundles uh, over this moduli space. I recall that sort of Intuitively, these line bundles can be seen as follows. Uh, if you have a Riemann surface with n mark points, and we know 
which point is number one, which point is number two, which point is number three. You can choose, for example, point number three, then you can consider their change on space to the Riemann surface. By technical reasons, algebraic geometers prefer to consider a cool tangent space. And since for them, it's not a Riemann surface, but a complex line, this is a, just a cotangent line. And then when you start to vary your Riemann surface and collection of points on it, you, know, you get a family of lines and this of complex lines. And this family of lines is exactly the, uh, the vector bundle of complex dimension one over the moduli space MGN, it is extendable to MGN bar. And one can consider as soon as they have holomorphic line bundle, you can define the associated first churn class. So we get, when we have n points, we have n distinguished classes of cohomology, and we can, of rank two, we can multiply them. And if we multiply them in such way that the product is has the rank of the, which is the dimension of the space MGN, we can integrate this class over MGN and we get an M. So this is on the, is notation for this number, which is used by algebraic geometers. On the left is notation, which is used by physicists. And basically you have to consider this notation using letters to as just one single symbol depending on partition D1, et cetera, D. What is important here is that sum of this D1 plus et cetera plus Dn is equal to 3G minus 3 plus N, which is the complex dimension of MGN. Since this class is F rank two, so the real dimension would be twice the sum of this D, which is exactly the real dimension downstairs, so we can integrate this thing, uh, this class, this is the top cohomology class, we can integrate it with respect to the base. If MGN bar would be a true complex manifold, we would get just an integer number. But this is a complex overfold, so these numbers are rational. And the third and the fourth lecture of Gimas one thing was uh, devoted to generating functions which incorporate all these numbers. So these numbers are quite famous. They were known to algebraic geometry since ages, but they, were, they became really famous due to after witness conjecture, uh, and which nowadays has already many proofs. So the initial proof of Kansevich was followed by Proof of Okunkov and Doripande by Mirzahani, by Kazarian and Landau, and their further groups. So you have sort of seen the interpretation of Witten conjecture in the lectures of Gimoswanki. And this is this uses their generating function, which englobes all these numbers and you know, this. And the relation between these numbers is encoded by some partial differential equations. But uh, since I told that my lectures are given from the point of view of an engineer, so I prefer to have to present you sort of equivalent formulation, which is an explicit recursive algorithm. How can one compute all these intersection numbers starting from the first two? So this is uh, this these two numbers appeared. In lectures of Dimas Wanki. So you have to compute them. And then you have several relations between these intersection numbers. So uh, which are as follows. So there is this string equation which allows you to get rid of entry zero, the Leton equation which allows you to get rid of entry one, and they are the main. Really, there is the main relation, which is called Verisor constraints, uh, which reads as follows. I suggest not to pay attention at, the, at combinatorial coefficients, but only at the structure of these relations. 
So we have already partitioned D1 and set with Dm. And we add an extra entry k plus one. And we express the intersection number corresponding to this partition in the following way. So this intersection number on the right is shorter. So you see here we have n plus one terms because we have n terms with D and an extra term with k plus one. Here we have n terms and this k plus one is, is hidden here. And we can add, well, we are adding k not k plus one, but we can add it to d1, to d2, et cetera, and we have the corresponding set. So this term is really nice because your partition is simpler. It is short. Now, the second term is as follows. You split, well, not k plus one, not k, but k minus one, into the sum of two numbers. And you add to partition P1, et cetera, Tn, two new entries, R and S. Well, the sum is getting smaller. In this sense, it's a little bit simpler. But the trouble is that this partition is long. So in this sense, the partition is not complete. And finally, there is a third term where basically you split your partition D1, et cetera, Dn into two subpartitions, and you split your k, k minus one into some R plus plus S, and you create one partition here, one partition here, and you compute the whole sum with respect to all these possible splittings. And a theorem says that, well, first that these relations that intersection numbers really satisfy those relations, and also that everything, well, looking at the structure, it is not difficult to, re, to, to verify that all intersection numbers are recursively defined by this recursion relations. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, do we need to uh, sum over uh, G prime? Uh, I see here uh, in genus uh, G, G prime, uh, not so. What G prime is defined if, as soon as you have uh, all, as soon as you have this partition mm -hmm. and the length of this partition. Mm -hmm. G prime mm -hmm. is, is uniquely determined because, oops, sorry. So, you see, the, ah, mm -hmm. the partition yeah. has to satisfy this relation. So, when you know the number of terms, mm -hmm. you compute G. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, so we know. The partition, yes. then we, yes. as soon as we know a partition, we can recover. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. We can recover both G and mm -hmm. or G prime and then prime. Mm -hmm. Okay, so everything would be wonderful, but from the point of view of engineer, there is a problem. So when you program these relations and you push the button of computer, then it works fairly well for short correlators, but for two correlators for three, four correlators, but I think that already for, I don't know, I say by more or less by random, but for example, for 10 correlators and some ridiculously small genus like six, I think that probably the modern computers are already unable to compute this intersection numbers. This recursion is very slow. I'm cheating a bit because they were several works optimizing this recursion, but still, if you try to use any of known, recur of known recursions in a straightforward way, then the capacities of computer are exceeded as soon as the length of correlators which you want to compute is sufficiently long. Already for, for relatively small j, which is the trouble. So there is this beautiful theory, algebraic theory, telling plenty of stuff about these numbers, but as an engineer, I want to know what are the values of these numbers, not, not what are the properties, what, what the algebraic properties, but what is the, the answer? What is the approximate value? And formally from this very nice recursion, it's very difficult to get them as soon as you want to know long correlators. Now, the very recent 
result in this direction is due to uh, Amola Verbal, uh, which proved the following asymptotic formula for all the intersection numbers. So on the left, you have just intersection. On the right, you have a sort of relatively reasonable expression in factorials. And the last term is one plus an error term. And this equation is just definition of the error term. So this is not a theory. Either. This is just definition of what is absolute. And the theorem says that this absolute becomes uniformly small as soon as genus becomes large and n not too large. So n is not allowed to be n. So when you make genus grow, n is allowed to grow not faster than square root of g, should grow slower than square root of g. For example, for any bounded n, this works perfectly well. You just consider n bounded by 100, and then you make genus 10 to infinity, and they have you have just immense variety of possible partitions. You see, G is now very large, N is say, bounded, but already for 3G minus 3, you can consider just enormous quantity of partitions. And the theorem says that for all these partitions simultaneously, this epsilon of D is uniformly small as soon as genus is large. And when I say genus large, well, for small N, Genus I don't know, 20 is some in some context is already very large, sort of close to infinity. So it is a quite good approximation, and I insist that the strength of this approximation is that it's uniform. It is valid for all partitions as soon as G is large and N not too large. Excellent. So I would need these intersection numbers as numbers. And this is the way how can so for small January compute them explicitly, for large January can use this solution. Okay, and now I want to show you how the intersection numbers appear in how can one use them in industrial purposes. And for this, I will wrap them into generating function, into a generating function, more or less as Demas Monkin did. But my generating function would be sort of more naive. Uh, it would be just a polynomial. So I will fix G and I will fix M. And then I have finite number of partitions of 3G minus 3 plus M. And I will do the following. So this is probably the main thing which I learned from combinatorics, when you have plenty of data, which is parameterized by some partitions or by some indices or whatever, it is very difficult to deal with this data, taking all these numbers one by one. And the best way to deal with them is to wrap all of them into one generating function and work with this generating function. And quite often, if you were smart enough in a way, you wrapped them into a generating function. This generating function has extremely beautiful properties. So here, as a generating function, we'll construct a polynomial. And we introduce, as always with generating functions, uh, formal variables, b1, etc., bn. I insist that in this, the genus g and the number of mark points n are fixed. So I have n variables, d1, et cetera, dn. And to encode the partition d1 plus et cetera plus dn equal 3g minus 3 plus n, I will use my formal variables to create a polynomial where d1 is taken power 2 d1, b2 power 2 d2, et cetera, dn power 2 d. So this monomial encodes the partition. And then I will consider the sum with respect to all possible partitions. And I will take the corresponding monomial and will multiply by their intersection number, except that I will tune up a little bit this intersection number. I will divide it 
by the product of factorials d1 factorial times d2 factorial. So when the letter is bold, it means that this is a multi multi index and factorial of multi index is d1 factorial times d2 factorial times etc times dn factorial. And I will also normalize it by the uh, common factor which depends on g and n. This factor is one of the same for all partitions. So this is my generator. Right now, this is just a formal generating function corresponding to fixed pair G and N. This is by construction homogeneous polynomial in, that in variables B of degree 6G minus 6 plus 2N. Uh, and you can ask, and what was the point of using this normalization? Well, there is no explanation from the point of view of generating function, but the geometric explanation is follows. So in with this normalization, which was chosen by hands, this generating function gets some in, in several contexts in geometric meaning. So after a numerical factor, which is here, this polynomial which we constructed coincides with the top homogeneous part of the Mirzakhani volume polynomial VGN. Providing the Weil Peterson volume of the multi space of order given series. So she considered the following objects. She considered uh, a sort of enhancement of the model space of curves. So when you consider the model space of complex curves, you can consider interpretation of a complex curve as a hyperbolic surface. Now, what Mirzahani did is she considered hyperbolic surfaces with boundaries, imposing that the boundary is geodesic boundary. So the, the boundary component is really, so she cuts the surface along geodesic. And then she gets extra parameters. If she has n components of the boundary, she can also memorize what are the length of the first component, of the second, and so on. The components are numbered. And the number is preserved. So, and we can memorize what is the boundary, what is the length of the boundary component number one, number two, etc. We and then you get modelized spaces parameterized by these variables B. And they also are endowed with by a Peterson metric. One can Compute the volumes of the small line spaces or border treatment surfaces. And theorem of Mirzahani says that the top, that this volume is polynomial in B, and the top uh, homogeneous part of this polynomial is the one which we have just constructed up to this numerical factor. So, this is the one of the reasons of choosing this uh, normalization. But this is not the only one. Uh, we'll use the same polynomial for different purposes in a second. And I'm preparing something which I will use in 10 minutes. Uh, so here we introduced, so coming back to our original construction, I claim initially that B1, etc., Bn are just formal variables which we use to construct a generating function. So from a huge collection of numbers, I constructed a polynomial. At some point, I will need to come back to numbers, and I will come back to numbers in a slightly tricky way. Uh, I will replace Schach polynomial, Schach monomial like this, by a number which is, so here is the product of monomials, uh, the product of variables bi to some powers of mi, and I will associate to such a monomial a number which is for each i, you take factorial of the power and you multiply by zeta function evaluated at the power plus one. And then you take a product from one to one. So you get the number. So every, to every monomial, we associate the number. And then we can extend to symmetric polynomials in this variables bi by linear. So to every homogeneous polynomial we can associate with the number. Okay, so 
I prepared my polynomial, my generating function to solve the following problem. So here, what you see is an object which already appeared in several lectures. This is a ribbon graph. And from topological point, so ribbon graph is a graph which is, you can sort of, I don't want to give a formal definition because it would take me time, but I'm considering the following ribbon. So I consider graphs embedded into an oriented surface. And ribbon graph is just tubular neighborhood of such a graph embedded into a surface. It is a subsurface from topological point of view of some genus or some number of boundary functions. So here for this particular ribbon graph, if I'm not mistaken, it is of genus one of two boundary factors. Good. So this is topology, but now let's pass to John. Now I can impose length to edges of the graph. And I will consider only integer length. So I'm, I assume that every edge of this skeleton of the ribbon graph, of the two graph, has certain length. And this length is an integer. Length. So as soon as all the edges at length, I can compute the length of boundary components in the following way. So, for example, let's take this boundary component, it follows this edge. So, I add the length of this edge to the length of the boundary component. Then it follows this edge. So, I add the length of this edge. Then it follows the next edge. I add the length of this edge. And so, so the length of the boundary component is the sum of length of edges which it follows. By definition. And now the problem. Suppose that we have a ribbon graph, or rather, suppose that we have all ribbon graphs of genus G with n boundary components. And I do not fix the length of the edges, I fix only the length of the boundary components, B1, etc. So already in this case, you can see that. So we have two boundary components, they follow all the edges, so they have equal length. And if I fix the length of the boundary component, I can vary a little bit my graph because I can make shorter one of the edges and compensate it by making longer another edge. So the metric structure of the graph changed by the topology and the length of boundary component did not. And now the problem. So suppose that I give you the following data, the genus, the number of boundary components, and the length of boundary components. I denote them by B1, et cetera. How many ribbon graphs with the data we can find? So this is a, an important combinatorial problem which pop ups, pops up in, in, in various contexts. So, Probably I have to slow down, make a print. So is the, the, the problem, the, some of the formulation of the problem is clear. So for example, in this particular problem, I just fix the two boundary components. I, yeah. No, probably I was cheating by saying that no, 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 no. They do not follow the same edges. No. They follow the, the collection of edges which they follow should be different. So I give the length of these two boundary components. Genus is one. How many ribbon graphs one can find? And the answer is given by the theorem, which uh, in this form, so it's a version of this theorem. Uh, was stated and proved by Kansevich, but in this particular form, uh, it is due to this reformulation is due to Paul Norbury. So suppose that, so we can see the collection of 
integers such that they are subassembly. We have to impose some conditions on the length. We have, we have to impose this condition on the sum of the boundary components because sum of the boundary components follows all edges twice. So every edge appears twice in the sum. So that's why I have to impose this condition. Otherwise, it's going to turn out. Then the weighted count of genus G connected trivalent metric urban runs with integer edges and with n label boundary components is equal to alpha mu. So here, up to lower order terms, we, so I'm taking the sum with respect to the set of all non-azimorphic trivalent, trivalent ribbon graphs of genus G with n boundary components. And also I'm using this weight. Actually, you might say that the statement is somehow vague because what does it mean plus how it returns? Uh, for formal and accurate definition, uh, not definition, formulation of the statement, I forward you to the original paper of Norbury, but a word of justification, what is beyond the story is that actually what is, so if you define the left hand side like this, and only for this, it is really important to take with uh, the weight one of the automorphism or the automorphism group of the ribbon graph. Uh, then what you have on the right is a quasi polynomial uh, and of this quasi polynomial really has low order terms, and really the top order term is this L polynomial and chain. So there is an, an absolutely accurate formalization of this term. Informal explanation one why you have to count with such weight is that it's sort of a In general principle in combinatorics when we're counting objects, it is always much more advantageous to count them with weight which is one over their order finite or the order of finite to move. Counting functions become much nicer and satisfy reasonable properties. And if you forget to do it, usually you are in trouble in the short term. Okay, but well, this is just a general principle. Okay, so probably I have to come back for one slide because for two slides. So this polynomial, which is responsible for counter metric ribbon groups, it's exactly the polynomial which is constructed using this intersection. Numbers. So this is my first application of intersection numbers to. to sort of very, at least the, the problems of combinatorics, which are formulated in this very simple mind. Now, I finally arrived to my favorite square tile surfaces. So instead of giving a definition, so before giving a formal definition of square tile surfaces, I'm giving you an example, which is on the right hand side of this picture. So this is it. So it is sort of special example, but it is particularly easy to understand. I took square tile paper and chopped out of square tile paper two polygons of the same shape following the sides of the squares. And then I placed, uh, I'm not sure whether it's visible, I put one polygon over the other. Uh, so topologically, I have two disks. So I glue the sphere from two disks, and my sphere is tiled with squares. Now, this tiling has the following properties: I can color. So I have, I can declare that, for example, this side of this particular square is vertical. And then 
This side would be also vertical, and this, so this way. This side is vertical, this side is vertical. So I have vertical sides and horizontal sides. And when I'm gluing squares, I'm gluing vertical sides to vertical and horizontal to horizontal. So, and this is there basically the, the definition. So suppose you have like a Lego box or a box of a puzzle where all the pieces of the puzzle are the same. They're just squares. And two sides of the squares are marked as vertical and two opposite sides. And two other opposite sides are marked as horizontal. And you are allowed to construct surfaces by attaching squares side by side, vertex to vertex. And the only requirement is to be the only extra, well, no, the two extra restrictions. So I prefer to consider only connected surfaces. Uh, and the rule is that we are gluing vertical sides, vertical sides, and horizontal to horizontal. In most of the vertices of the resulting tiling, we have just four squares attached to such a vertex. But there are some vertex, vertices where there are more squares, like here, there are six, and or less, like here, there are only two, right? There is one square here on the upper side, and there is another square hidden below. So it is the corner of the pocket, and it's at such corner, I have only two squares attached to this. So now my New problem is uh, I want to count how many square touches I can construct using at most very, very large number n of squares, assuming that I want to construct all the surfaces of G to G and have exactly n forms like this with cone angle pi, that is exactly small m so i'm not and capital number of squares which i can use i'm not obliged to use all of them but i can use at most a very huge number of capital squares and i want to have exactly n points like this where there are only two squares which are attached so this is my new combinatorial problem which is sort of more complicated than counting ribbon graphs but which is closely related as we'll see in a second. Now, are there any questions about squared answers? Um, so yes, I have a question. Um, so yeah. um, are you supposed to be able to, to reconstruct the, the square tiled surface on the right from the surface on the left? Uh, not uniquely. So I did not tell yet. So. Uh, so you're, you're sort of going ahead because I didn't even define yet how to associate surface on the left with the surface on the right. But if we're already discussing this, look, you can do the following thing. You can, for example, cut your square that surface, surface by this red circle and then twist everything by one unit or by two units or by three units. It would not. Uh -huh. So the surface on the left would remain the same. So the surface on the left, uh, it encodes a huge pack of square tile surfaces. Uh, I, I see. And 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 how how do you see this uh, vertices on the right? Uh, so on the on the right hand side, you see you I, have surfaces. I, okay, then. Then probably before answering your question, I have to define the surface on the left. I didn't do it yet. And before that, I have to answer, uh, I have to answer your question. Uh, All right, sorry about that. Thanks. That you need to move them first for the vertical and horizontal. Why I want this? Yes. Uh, because I absolutely agree. This is a very natural question. Because the other problem is also very interesting. What is the number of quadrangulations of a given surface? But this is a different problem. And it is somehow, it is more complicated. This one is slightly easier. This is one reason. 
Uh, and rather, it's not a reason. I'm just saying that there are two different problems. Both have right of existence. But I'm particularly interested in this problem because their square tile surfaces, which correspond to this restricted bloom, they secretly correspond to quadratic differentials and to non lens spaces of quadratic differentials and so on. And, and I'm particularly interested in this type of spaces. So the square tile surfaces we was asking about correspond to quartic differentials, and by some reasons they are slightly less interesting. They're still interesting, but, but the, the life of quadratic differentials and of one differentials is somehow richer, and, and they have some very important texture structure. So this is the true answer. And now I can define the surface on the left. So the surface on the left is defined as follows. So topologically, it should have the same genus of the surface on the right, it's the square tile surface. And then I do the following. So forget, for example, for a while, forget about red curves. I just have to define where cusps, cusps appear. As soon as I have a point where there are only two squares which I touched, so a point where the cone angle is pi, I declare that on the for the surface on the left, I will create the cusp of this cone. So here we have points with cone angle pi here. This cusp corresponds to this guy. Here, this cusp corresponds to this guy. Then here and here, these two cusps here, fifth cusp, and at the bottom, two more cusps. So that's how I construct these cusps. Uh, and So this is what is written on the slide. That by convention, the hyperbolic metric, which I associate to the surface on the right, has cusps at the marker points. Now, uh, the, the meaning of the red curves, which I would use later, is the following. So here, you might notice, I don't know whether it's sufficiently visible on the screen, that their surface is uh, colored in four different colors, and I color in separate colors, separate maximal horizontal cylinders. So, for example, this thing, which is shaded uh, in dark, is filled with circles parallel to this one, and I can go up and down, and I will fill this, this part. Then I arrive to this singular point, and if I want to go upper, then my new circle will become longer and I will get a new circle. So for every cylinder, I draw the waist curves in red, and these waist curves appear on the surface of the map. Now, actually, now when I made this encode, I can associate. So the surface also, it's stable graph. So from this surface to stable graph, I can go in the following way. Just consider their dual graph to this collection of red curves. Uh, and with extra, so the vertices of this dual graph, of this stable graph, Correspond to components of this surface if you cut if you cut it by all red curves, and the edges are dual to red curves. And to recall where are the cusps are located, I draw this funny legs, which allow to indicate where we have where we're located cusps. And this stable graph encodes also the following notch. So if you shrink this red curves completely, what you will get would be a stable curve as in the lectures of Dimas Wonka. And this graph on the right describes the structure of the stable graph. What is missing 
because we're in zero zero is that near every vertex of this graph I have to write what is the genus of the corresponding component. Another way to see this stable graph is the following. Sorry, one more one before I'm passing to the middle pitch. So, and this is uh, in continuation to the question of, of Sasha. Uh, that if you, your number of squares is huge enough, the tones of square tile surface. However, the number of the stable graphs, it is defined by genus and by the number of cusps. And for each G and N, there is finite number of stable graphs. And the stable graphs correspond are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, boundary classes of MGN. They really encode the way your curve can degenerate. They encode the types of stable graphs. Now, the picture on the, in the middle. I, as you can recognize, I just took a neighborhood. So I initially I had this picture. I took a tabular, tubular neighborhood of each red curve and took it out. So I choked my surface by these red curves. And that's what I did. And we see that their resulting components correspond to vertices of the stable graph, and that the resulting components are nothing but green graphs, which we have seen 15 million ago. And now I can tell you the strategy of how we'll compute square tile surfaces of given genus. With given number of markets. So, so, sorry, um, yep. a quick question. Um, I, for the current points which aren't current angle pi, are you allowing for current angles bigger than four pi? So, there, these cusps, or what is the same, these legs, correspond to conical points of angle pi only. And the other Conical points, for example, here we have a conical similarity with the angle uh, with the three pi. I just ignore them in this coding and in this coding. Okay, but um, uh, I understand that when you're uh, associating the hyperbolic structure, you ignore those, but um, but they can be a priori. Oh, oh sorry, I see. Now I, I now I understand your question. So yeah. Uh, I'm cheating here in the world, not cheating, but I'm hiding this problem under the carpet in the following way. If you consider all possible square tile surfaces, which correspond to, for example, this given ribbon graph, where you fix genome and the data, then their number of square tile surfaces corresponding to this data would be Asymptotically, when number of squares is large, when you use at most n squares and n is large, it would uh, okay. be of n, which would be the dimensional of some principal stratum of it. So, I see, I see. Uh, okay. services with more tricky degenerations, they represent their number would be polynomial of smaller power. So, asymptotically, I can just neglect. Yeah, okay, understood. Thanks. They, it's basically it is up to you. You can consider them or not. It does not. It does not affect asymptotics because they are they are so small that the, the, their number is relatively small, absolutely very large, but relatively so small that we can just ignore them. Most of, of surfaces would be like this. So most of these blue graphs, for sorry, for 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 vast majority of surfaces, these blue graphs would be trivalent. So. Which is wonderful because this gives us a strategy for counting square culture. So the strategy would be as follows. So I want to so recall the problem. I want to compute the number, the asymptotic number of square tile surfaces of genus G with 
n legs or n touch or n points like this. Uh, and sorry, I'm using n twice, but one n is small n, which is number of these legs, cusps, or whatever. And another n is m capital, which is responsible for the number of squares. And this m capital tends to infinity. So you are allowed to use m capital squares at, at most m capital squares, not necessarily all of them. And you want to compute how many square tile surfaces you can construct. So I will count square tile surfaces, not all together, but part by part. I will consider all possible stable graphs corresponding to my genus G and small m. And I will, for each stable graph, I will compute square tile surfaces corresponding to the stable graph. <coughs> and I will do it in the following way. So if I chop my surface like this, I already know how many, so every component is nothing but a ribbon graph. And recall that in, in the, so here, this is genus zero. So all components have genus zero. In the most general setting, I also have labeled the vertices saying what genus correspond to, its, to each vertex. So for each layer like this, I know the genus, I know the number of components, and I will introduce parameters B, which are the length of components. And the, the problem of counting ribbon graphs with this topology and with given length of boundary components is already solved. We know the number. So now, given a decomposition like this, with fixed length of each boundary component, I have to count how many ways there are to assemble these guys pasting in cylinders. But this is elementary because basically when all the length of when all this structure and the length of components are already fixed, the only thing which I can do is to choose the height of the cylinder and also their twist, which I use to attach this. So when I, when I attach a cylinder going this to this, I can twist it by one, by two, by three, up to B. So I have B choices where B is the perimeter of this circle. And then the, the counting problem becomes really a technical exercise. So I'm not giving you an answer. You have to compute some integral, but it is. I hope that it is already visible that the main part of the problem is already solved. So let me consider, let me illustrate the idea on a very specific example, which is sort of as naive as possible. So may I ask one question about the previous picture I'm very sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also you might have answered that my internet was lagging. So uh, somehow the this vertices which only attached, which are only attached to two tiles, I understand them in terms of the left picture. But uh, the points which are attached to more than two tiles um, is the number of the. So, for example, on this very top, well, and the, the third from the top horizontal uh, piece, could you put another vertex in the middle? Does it make any sense, or you don't want to do that? Uh, so, I do, I do not want to control them. They would distribute as they want. But look, I have surface of genus zero with three boundary components. So the corresponding ribbon graph will force to, so as, as soon as I assume that it is just trivalent ribbon graph that the vertices here, here have values three, uh, there would be automatically two vertices or values three just by topological distance. Uh, I see. Thanks so much. Yeah, I see. Thank you. But their position, their location, I do not. Con I do not want to control because I want. So I impose the length of this component, of this component, and of this component, and I consider as parameters. I'm counting all metric ribbon graphs with, of genus zero with boundary components of length b1, b2, b3, with three boundary components of length b1, b2, b3. 
That's my parameters. And then there would be some amount of, of ribbon graphs like this. It would be not one. Uh, oh, wait a bit. No, there would be there would be one. In this particular case, there would be one, but but in general, there would be many, and and depending on the so and in general case, the length of the ages would vary and so on, and they would somehow move along this blue level. But the number of them is defined by topology. I see. Thanks so much. Uh, also, um, we actually, if we're online, we don't see your pointer. Uh, so most of the time it's clear, but uh, yeah. Uh, just you, you, you do not see my pointer, sorry. So, well, I mean, no. Oh, yeah, fine. right, no. right, right. If I'm stupid because I'm no, showing the blackboard. I have to show here. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. So when, when I would be answering questions, I apologize. I would be using the pointer on the screen, uh, on the screen of my notebook. Yeah, I was I was so excited that I'm giving the true lecture, the true audience that, they, that I can use hand, wave hands and somehow use the point, right? I'll try to link here. Okay. So let me show you an example of computation. So we'll compute the number of square tiled tori, tiled with at most n capital squares in the following way. So by technical reasons, I have to mark a point. And now my ribbon graph is just one circle. And I use parameter B for the length of the circle. And then I have some height here. And I cut my torus, I chop my torus along this horizontal circle, which has length B. So I open it up, I get a cylinder. Now I want to compute how many tori I can do. So my parameters are perimeter of the horizontal circle, which is B, the height of the cylinder, which I obtained by cutting my torus by a horizontal circle, which I denote by H, by height. And also I have a twist parameter because when I glue the top boundary component to the bottom boundary component, I can glue directly or I can twist by one, by two, by three, up to B, or rather up to B minus one if I start with zero. Because if I use twist B, then I can use then twist and twist B is equivalent to twist zero. Okay, now we know, already know how to compute this, the number, how to count the square tiles total. So I, as soon as I fix parameters B and H, I know that there are exactly B tori which correspond to B twists. So for each pair B and H, I have B tori. And now I have to count the sum of the of B with respect to all pairs B and H, such that the total number of squares, which is the area of the torus, which is B times H, is bounded by N capital. So this is my number of square tile tori tiled with a cost. Oops, <laughs> this, is, this is the number of my square tiled tori tiled with at most n capital squares. So B is the perimeter of the horizontal circle, H is the height, and I have to compute the sum. Or rather, I have to compute the leading term uh, in asymptotics with respect to n when n tends to infinity for such sum. Well, the first modification is this in this computation is almost trivial. I just rewrite the condition that the area of the torus, which is bh, is at most n, is b is at most n over h. Nothing happened. I just slightly modify this inequality by dividing by h. Now, this is, this sum can be approximated in the following way. I consider, so I, so I consider this sum for each to equal to one, each equal to two, each equal to three, and so on. And counting the sum for different ages, as soon as H is fixed, the sum is approximately 
uh, so since with, with some b for b which varies from zero to n over h this is approximately n over h squared over two and here this is a symptotic relation because i pretend that h goes from zero to infinity when n is sufficiently large the tail is sufficiently small so this is sort of legal now this sum from this sum i can quotient n squared and i get just sum of one over h squared which is zeta of two so zeta of two is pi squared over six we have computed the number of squared out tori it's n squared over two times zeta of two and now recall that zeta of two is fits my definition where i transform a polynomial in b into a number so i started from a sum of a polynomial in b where i count the sum with respect to all b and h such that bh is at most n and i get this answer now i claim that if b is not a single variable but a multivariable so if if b is b1 b2 b3 etc and h is also multivariable h1 h2 etc when they say k cylinders this condition bh should be considered as scalar product b1 h1 plus b2 h2 etc which is the total area of the surface and i claim that if you consider if you compute the similar sum we have a polynomial in b then you get some easily computable power of n which is the dimension of corresponding stratum divided by some factorial and multiplied by this operator z of z z z round and i i have to show the last several slides so instead of formulating right away a theorem i will show you how i compute square tile surfaces as genus two without cusps so first claim believe me that what you see on the right the, the right picture represents all possible stable graphs in genus two for g equal to two and small n equal to zero there are no other stable graphs and these stable graphs correspond to the generations of the surfaces on the left so now i compute as promised, I compute square tile surfaces graph by graph. Let me choose some by random. For example, this, the last from the bottom, or the, not the last, the second from the bottom, for example, this one. It corresponds to this decomposition of the surface. So when I chop my surface by these three lines, I get two spheres with, so this guy becomes, so I, I chop this and I open up this. So I get the sphere with three boundary components. So I have to use polynomial N03. And the length of boundary components are B2. And the other two are B1 and B1, because I made a cut here. So I have to use this polynomial. And for the second part, I have to use polynomial also N03, because this is a sphere of genus zero with three boundary components of length B2, B3, B3. And also, I have to multiply by this B1, B2, B3, which is responsible for twists. Now, these coefficients, which are in red and in blue, are responsible for symmetries and number of components. So basically, this polynomial in B tells me how many, if I fix the boundary components, of a cylinder decomposition of corresponding to this stable graph or to, to this way to chop my surface into pieces. So how many ways, how, how many ways there are to glue them? And then as on the slide with the torus, I can transform this. I can now introduce parameter H, which is responsible for the uh for heights of the cylinders compute corresponding sum so this is just the true values of i replaced the intersection numbers 
uh, which were used in the definition of these polynomials by corresponding actual rational numbers. So that's the true polynomials in B, which we get. And then I apply the same procedure as the previous slide, transforming these polynomials into the sums into the number of squared out surfaces. And that's what I get. I already divided by the power of n capital. And, and this is up to this power of n capital. This is there the asymptotics in the number of squared out surfaces. And this is just the formal theorem, which says that one can compute squared out surfaces in the same way. And uh, there, probably the last remark is that the bayard peterson volume of MGN corresponds to the constant term in the volume polynomial MGNL. Uh, when the length of all boundary components are contracted to zero. And finally, to compute the major reach volume, to compute the number of square tiles, so I didn't pronounce the word major reach volume yet, we need the top homogeneous part of volume polynomials. Top polynomials. So we need exactly the opposite regime. But, that, that, but we use the very same polynomials. And this is the perfect, perfect moment to stop because the second chapter was, so the first chapter was for a section for engineers. We really solved some absolutely concrete counting problem. And the second part is geometrical. It was, it is rather explanation of why count square tiles, count of square tile services really corresponds to count of major reach volumes. I will postpone it either to the second lecture or maybe even to the third, because I prefer to, to tell concrete stories and not and not general constructions. So thank you for your attention. That's all for today. Are there any questions? Um, I have a question uh, and it's it's sort of a follow-up question from the previous one where I asked about um, mm -hmm. uh, Higher, um, higher degree yes. uh, current angles, and and to which you you responded, um, uh, yeah, that you know you saw that the the question behind it. Um, so I was thinking about the picture because like, uh, yeah, so you're right in that that they're, they're less generic, so asymptotically they should mm -hmm. disappear. Um, uh, and I was thinking like uh, back to, I mean this this is talking about maze of each volumes, but like you just said, it's related to the Peterson volume, um, and when uh, Witten formulated uh, like his conjecture um, and he was playing around with uh, two-dimensional um, uh, gravity, um, I think that there's a part in that paper where instead of just taking triangles and then piecing it together and then you see asymptotically what happens, um, you could also take like squares and, and other shapes um, and piece them and then I think the claim was that there was some sort of either pattern to it or some sort of universality about the behavior. So um, do you expect that if you look at, for example, square tiled surfaces um, built out of uh, you know, higher degree cone angled um, pieces and so forth, that there should be some you know, uh, nice picture that maybe possibly even you know you can extract the maze of each volume again or maybe like um, uh, volumes of lower dimensional strata or things like that so exactly so this is their first their problem is absolutely meaningful in geometrically so i apologize to everybody uh, who never heard about maze of each volumes but jumping ahead uh, yes if you you can fix there so you can fix the following extra data when you're gluing your square when you when you are gluing your squares you can mm -hmm. ask in addition that the holonomy of the resulting flat surface is trivial that that your mm -hmm. sides are not only distributed into horizontal and vertical but that your horizontal sides are oriented and 
vertical, also oriented like the square in the, in the first quadrant of the, of the plane. And then mm -hmm. when you come together, you respect this orientation. What you get would correspond to abelian differential and you get much less square tiled surfaces like this, but it's quite meaningful to count them. And if you, if you count all of them, you will get major rich volume of the model A space of a billion differentials. Now, if you, in addition to this, you choose whether you're counting this more restricted a billion differentials or less restricted case, which corresponds to quadratic differentials, you can fix their uh, number of these special vertices we have several squares glued. And this corresponds to fixing the degrees of zeros of abelian differential or correspondingly quadratic differential. And then you can compute the major rich volume of the corresponding stratum. For, and this is again, this is the most restricted problem. And again, it's completely meaningful. And for abelian differentials, it is, well, there is this, there is, quite satisfactory solution. Now, mm -hmm. quadratic differentials, there is a formula which is not very efficient, but the formulas based on intersection theory are already written down, but they are still conjectural. This is due to uh, Dawi Chen, uh, Martin Muller and Adrien Sauvage. And the formulas during this, this technique with ribbon graphs, uh, there are some, but, and this is work in progress of Alice Goujar, and this corresponds morally, instead of computing the, your, your computer, yeah. Uh, the problem, so, so, this story is still work in progress in several parallel ways by several group of people. But okay, I agree that the question is absolutely meaningful and it already has answers in the very satisfactory answers in the case of the model of strata of model A spaces of abelian differentials and it is work in progress for strata of model A spaces of quadratic differentials. And also formally, there is a, a, a formula due to Eskin to Kunkov and Eskin to Kunkov and Deripander, which gives you all volumes for strata of low, low dimension. So it's something like up to dimension 12. The trouble is that their approach uses uh, characters of symmetric group. And when dimension grows, you have to, to operate with tables of characters of enormous size and, and computers dice, compu computer dice trying to manipulate this, this data become, becomes very, very heavy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? I'm sorry, we, we are very much behind the schedule. Okay, so probably, probably I, I will be happy to answer the, the questions uh, after the second lecture, if you don't mind. Or? Uh, yes, but with the, with the blackboard. Yes, so, so I suggest to stop the session now because the next lecture is. Yes, okay, so now we make five minutes break till 6.25 p.m. Moscow time. And then we, we will continue.